So why are we interested in the BRIC countries, Brazil, Russia, India, and China? Well, it's 40% of the world's population, according to the CIA World Factbook, and makes up a total combined net population of almost 3 billion people. According to uh, gross domestic product statistics, you can see that the BRIC countries uh, claim quite a bit of a gross domestic product, with China now second behind the United States and quickly, uh, quickly climbing in uh, the world rank. So we're interested in these big four currently in the top seven of the world's economies based on gross domestic product. And it really has been a shift in leadership and global economic power away from the developed G7 econ economies and towards the developing world. It's estimated that the BRIC economies will overtake G7 economies by 2027, which is just around the corner. And by 2050, Goldman Sachs predicts that the combined BRIC economies could eclipse the combined economies of the current richest countries in the world. Of course, these are just predictions, and we know that the world is uh, constantly changing and shifting, uh, particularly economically and politically. Well, we'll start with top with Brazil, EMC compliance and certification. The chief regulatory organization in Brazil is INMETRO, which stands for Brazil's National Institute of Metrology, Quality and Technology. It has been formed for over 40 years to support Brazilian enterprise, increase productivity and quality of goods and services. They're also the, also the national standards body that uh, uh, issues Brazilian standards according to many different types and um, uh, categories. In addition, they're the main accreditation body for Brazil certification bodies and laboratories. That means they designate the approved sources for certification and regulatory approvals. They're also tasked with developing the Brazil's conformity assessment program. And in addition, they are responsible for the point of contact for Brazil's technical barriers to trade under the World Trade Organization program. They function a lot like a combination of NIST in terms of standards and in terms of interface with the rest of the world. So according to the InMetro mandatory certification list, there's about 80 products on this list, including electrical and electronics. Medical equipment, hazardous location equipment, cords and cables, protective devices, things that, things that you would estimate uh, would be required for uh, certification. In addition, there's another 70 products, everything from baby seats to auto glass on this list. Emetro also maintains a voluntary certification list, which can, consumers may look to as a, as a point of quality, including bottled natural mineral water, computer goods, ceramic blocks or masonry, and something called cachaça, which is a sugarcane alcohol, which is the Brazil's national drink. I've enjoyed some of that from time to time. So here's sort of an overview of the organizational structure and the flow of how a product may be certified. First, you have a metro in the middle as we talk. As we said, they're responsible for the standards and certification process overview. And then we have the OCPs, which is the product certification body, your CB, which is accre accredited by Emetro. Overlap with that are the test labs, which would be also uh, overseen by Emetro. So currently there are 51 certification bodies uh, accredited by Emetro across a range of product types. The Brazilian network of testing laboratories has about 372 testing labs. Uh, that are authorized to operate and do testing. For the for a metro marking, the metro marking label is required, and it has uh, several different elements, including the type of accreditation or certification, uh, the certification body number, and the type of accreditation code that the certification body maintains. For telecommunications products, Anatel is the governing body, similar to the FCC in the United States. And they are tasked with the development of the infrastructure telecommunications and exercising stand standards, homologation, and enforcement. So they've been around since July 1997, and 
Regulation 242 issued in 2000, year 2000, is the general regulation regarding certification of telecom products. So these would be devices that connect in some way to the public network, either wirelessly or wired networks. Under this Anatel scheme, they also have certification body and test laboratories that are accredited. So currently there are 13 accredited OCDs or certification bodies accredited by Anatel, and there are 20 accredited laboratories. And the universe here looks something like this with Anatel at the center and the certification body accredited by Anatel. And in this case, there's a local representative component as well that uh, must serve as a, a point of contact in Brazil. So the manufacturer may go through a third party agent or go directly if they have a route. Um, and that uh, process would include a certification package, the usual types of um, details on product type and technical details that would be submitted to the test laboratory in Brazil. Now currently Brazil re requires mandatory in-country testing uh, for our pro all products, so you must te send test samples to them. Ultimately, the cer certificate looks something like this. It's issued by Anatel. There is no expiration date on the certificate. And what you find in various regulatory schemes that certificates may expire, they may not. For example, in the United States, the FCC certificate is good for the life of the product or however long you hold it. However, other countries such as China has expiration dates on the certificate. Now it's critical I have a local representative because they will receive the Anatel homologation certificate. For certification bodies is issued by OCD, they may have a expiration date depending on the product and typically issued directly to the manufacturer. So it depends on what scheme you're going for. Anatel has a two, couple of different category types. Category one is terminal equipment intended for use by the general public. And this can include AC, DC adapters used with cell phones, uh, UMTS devices, cordless phones, wired phones. Uh, also have lithium battery requirements for cell phones. So annual ma maintenance on this, the certificate is valid for one year and requires product testing and evaluation of the factory quality system. The second category is equipment not covered by the first category. And this is the devices that use directly the radio frequency spec spectrum that connect to the network. So these are your usual things, antennas, amplifiers, transceivers, RF devices, which can include low power devices as well as cellular, cellular devices. In this case, the certificate is valid for two years and requires the testing in country. The third category are things that are not included in category one and two, but they have an interoperability component with the telecommunications network. These can include things like cables, multiplexers, data equipment, switches, hubs, gateway, these types of things. <clears throat> so this, in this case, the certificate is valid until the device is modified or a regulation changes. Again, it requires product testing. This is a sort of a typical uh, potential schedule flow. So first, you ship the sample to the uh, to the, author the te test laboratory. The testing is done. It may take a few weeks. Hopefully, uh, your product will be uh, passed the test quickly. And this can include a combination of EMC, safety, RF, functional, and potentially SAR, depending on the device. Then another week or so for submitting the test reports. <laughs> and in this case, we're working with the client to prepare the application product. After that, the CB may review the application. They may have some questions. There may be some communications back and forth, but hopefully that is confined to maybe a two week process. After that, the Anatel reviews and issues the homologation certificate for the device. So you're looking at something like eight to 10 weeks from uh, start to finish on a, a typical Brazil product. This is a, a short sample of the Anatel standards. Um, in this case, They've often adopted either US or international standards. So you'll see uh, typical uh, standards referring to uh, IEC or CISPR types of requirements.
Now, Brazil also has requirements for SAR, and this is very similar to the FCC. This is for devices that are used less than 20 centimeters from the body and <clears throat> where the average power is, um, is greater than uh, 20 milliwatts. So if your device is portable, operates close to the human body, and between the frequency of 300 megahertz and 6 gigahertz, you must cr create a SAR report. This is the label that's issued. You must have the Anatel homologation number, the Anatel logo, the EAN barcode, trademark, and other compliance warning statements. And these are the minimum dimensions for those different elements of the label. Okay, let's go across the pond, so to speak, to, to the Russians or Custom Unions, Union EMC Compliance and Certification Overview. In Russia, they have the uh, Technical Regulament or Regulation or TRCU for Technical Regulations for the Customs Unit Certification. There's also a component of hygienic conclusion, which is really safety to users and safety to the populace, and the SFIAS certification, which is for telecom devices. And the general area of, uh, of regulatory um, scope here is product safety, EMC, sanitary regulation as regards to food and other types of uh, potential hazards, and also the functional electrical and radio characteristics. Under a previous scheme uh, with under the Soviet Union, they had the GOST certification system, and this was withdrawn a few years ago and replaced by the Customs Union regime. There is a grandfather until March 20, 2015, which has now expired, but getting a TRCU certification means you can have market access for your product in Russia, Armenia, Belarus, Kazakhstan, and Kyrgyzstan. However, those four last uh, markets are relatively small. And it's anticipated that a few more countries may join over time. These are republics that are former USSR and non-European Union, as you might suspect. So we'll go through each one of these generally. So starting with the TRCU certification. This is the uh, mark of conformity for the TR cer certificate. And almost any electronic product to be imported to Russia must have the new TRCU certification to comply with safety, technical, and quality standards. The logo is required, and the identification code of the certification body should also be shown on the logo. Now, the term of the grant of the certification depends on the product and is valid for a term of one to five years. Here are the categories you might expect, uh, ITE, audio video equipment, household appliance, wireless and wired telecommunication equipment, scientific instrumentation, measurements, and medical equipment. These are the different categories under the TRCU certificate. Under the hygienic certification, which is also called the Sanitary Epidemiology Conclusion Certificate, it confirms that the conformity of products and services to sanitary norms in the process, manufacture, storage, transportation, sale of products and services. So this is really a safety-oriented regulation that it looks to protect the populace. And it can include uh, foods or vibration or noise or any other kinds of uh, potential hazards to human health. So here's a partial list of the product categories. Uh, for example, devices that may produce noise or vibration. There are limits on copy machines, printers, air conditioners. Uh, in, there's also a category for individual protection means or personal protective equipment, PPE, such as gloves and safety goggles. Uh, tobacco products and raw materials are covered. Another category is any device emitting x-rays, can be video monitors or television receivers. Of course, the cathode ray tube is uh, pretty much extinct at this point. But you do have other products that emit uh, radio frequency energy, such as cell phones, wireless phones. Uh, laptops and other computer type devices. The SFIAS certification is basically applies to telecommunications equipment. So this is network and compatibility process. Now one thing that you must consider yourself uh, when you're doing the, pro uh, the planning of this, customs clearance of any product imported to Russia can be a very challenging process and you can expect some customs duties 5 to 20 percent depending on the pur purpose. 
and it's no, in the normal way calculated as a percentage of the custom declared value of the goods. In addition, there may be value added tax that's applied, another 20%. So you have to be uh, mindful of this when you're planning and budgeting for the certification process. So for radio devices, <clears throat> there's a different uh, sort of flow here we can talk, discuss. <laughs> and you have different types of uh, radio, uh, electronic devices, communication, wired optical, which means there's no RF transmitters, such example, a, a router or switch or some other network connection device. The other type would be a uh, communication device, such as an 802.11 access point. And the other one would be a non-communication device, for example, a car alarm, something that doesn't necessarily have uh, communications properties, but may use a remote control or something like that. So under the first uh, category, the telecom approval from the Federal Agency of Communications, there's a declaration of conformity or certificate, and you register, and you're allowed to enter the market. For the other types of devices, you may have a combination of things. For example, uh, uh, access point or wireless device, wireless data device. You need to have an import importation per permit from the radio frequency centers. Then the radio permit is issued to a Russian dealer only, and then you're allowed to enter the market. A brief overview of India EMC compliance and certification is next. So we'll talk about uh, some introduction, the, wire, the WPC, a TEC, and something that is MT and CTE. So a lot of acronyms, but we'll, we'll expand on that and discuss what these things mean to you. So the Ministry of Communications and Information Technology is under the Parliament, and they have different departments, as you might ex expect in a large bureaucracy. They have the Department of Electronics and Information Technology, uh, Department of Telecom, and the Department of Posts or Mailing. And under the DOT, there's two other organizations, the Telecom Engineering Center, or TEC, and the Wireless Planning and Coordination Wing. And they both have different missions, but they're mixed together a lot, a little way. So WPC was created in 1952 and is very much similar to something like the FCC. And they establish, maintain, and operate wireless stations or issue licenses for that purpose. And the WPC is divided into three sections, licensing and regulations, new technology group, and the standing advisory committee on RF allocations. So they decide how to divvy up the spectrum in India. So radio frequencies for wireless communications are defined sort of in the, in the usual spectrum from three kilohertz to 3000 gigahertz. And this is uh, pretty much an international definition of uh, radio frequencies. There are two certification schemes. One is called the uh, license, and the other, other is equipment type approval. Under the w WPC network license, you can have these different 35 different types, which are uh, come from everything from broad satellite broadcast to GSM equipment, FM broadcast, pretty much every kind of uh, license use that you expect. Under the Wireless Planning Coordination, ETA, um, the uh, government of India has established certain de-licensed ban, which is equivalent to our unlicensed bans or unli unlicensed use. The Telecommunication Engineering Center, TEC, it's a technical body that represents the industry of the Department of Telecommunications of Indian government. And it looks at common standards for network equipment and services. It also issues interface approvals, certificates of approvals, and type approvals. Also is required is a task with the formulation of standards and technical plans, and has a lot of coordination between different international groups such as Etsy and ITU. So the TEC approval has these kinds of certificates, interface approval, type approval, certificate approval, and technology approval. And there are four general requirements with uh, four general types of technical requirements and a total of 613 documents uh, that, uh, that uh, form the flow, manage the flow of this uh, process. Now, one of the big changes uh, in 2017 was the issuance of the mandatory testing and certification of telecommunication equipment, or the MT and CTE. And this covers the types of telecommunication to be 
uh, connected uh, on the India telecommunication network. Now this was um, going forward initially as of October of last year, but it had been pushed off to March of this year, and it covers a variety of uh, requirements such as EMI, EMC, safety, other technical requirements, and uh, any other requirements notified by the T Telecommunications Engineering Center. One of the interesting things is uh, security requirements. So there's a mandatory cyber component that is attached to this process. And that's somewhat unique in the world, at least in my, uh, my experience. So as I mentioned, it was mandated, supposed to be mandated by March of 2017. However, two days ago, the government of India issued a proclamation that is going to delay the requirement for this uh, uh, mandatory testing from August of 2019. One of the things that has occurred over the last uh, few years is um, a rapid interest in growing test laboratories in, in India. Uh, and what the government and the industry recognized that there just weren't enough test laboratories stood up in order to meet the demand to meet that particular uh, deadline. So they pushed it off. We'll see if they'll push it off again. Uh, India does have SAR requirements for mobile handsets. Um, they've adopted the FCC requirements, which is pretty strict, one of the strictest ones in the world. So we'll go north and a little bit east uh, to China now. So there's several different types of certifications in China, from radio approvals to quality uh, to uh, a network attachment licenses. And the three main ones are CCC, or China Compulsory Certification. The second one, which, attach, which applies to network attachment equipment, is the Network Access License, or NAL. And then the SRC Radio Type Approval, which is for any radio transmitter. There may also be uh, functionality requirements as well. So under the China organizations, you have the China Certification and Accreditation Administration, or CNA, CNCA. There's also China Accreditation Board for Certifiers, and there's nine accredited bodies under that scheme. Then the China Accreditation Boards for Laboratories, and there's 880 labs accredited. And the China Auditor and Training Education Board under CNCA. So the CCC applies primarily to EMC and to uh, product safety. And in order to determine whether you have to do a CCC uh, route, you look at the uh, product codes and categories. Currently, there are 19 categories and 132 types of products on that list. And basically, you go to that, category, that uh, catalog and determine if your product exists on that catalog sheet. And if it does exist, you must do CCC. Here's just some of the name of the product categories. Electric wires and cables, connectors, low voltage switches. These are pretty much the things that you might expect to be uh, on a CCC mark. You'll also find CCC marks on window glass and, and other uh, non-electrical devices as well. So it's not simply confined to electrical electronic products. As you can see, the bottom one is chemistries for carpentry. So there's a chemical uh, analysis for some types of devices. So you must get permission to print the CCC mark. You must put the logo on there, and then you're allowed to print your own CCC mark. This is a uh, typical China product label you might find, which has the specifications, the ratings, the model number, the company name, the product name in Chinese, the CCC logo is, uh, also, and the country of origin. There is a factory inspection that's required. Uh, you can file for a factory inspection while you ship the product over to China for testing, uh, which means that you must test in country. Um, and the initial factory inspection, there are 10 aspects to be inspected, which you might expect documents and records, training, purchasing, receiving, inspection, uh, verification tests, et cetera. And there is an annual follow-up inspection. So they have a... CCC also for EMC has two different classes of equipment, Class A and Class B, which are similar to the uh, Class A and Class B um, classifications under US, Europe, and other international requirements. 
And this is an example of the warning label that you have to put on the CCC um, user manual. So under a Ministry of Information um, regulatory department, there's two different categories. Uh, Telecom Administration Bureau and the State Radio Regulations Committee. Now the Telecom Administration Bureau manages the network access license. So this is similar to something like PTCRB or uh, GCF um, compat intercompatibility requirements. So that would apply to a mobile phone, for example. Under the State Radio Regulations Committee, they issue what's called the uh, radio type approval or certification for any kind of radio device. Under the network access license, you have document review, product testing, you'll issue a certificate and require monitoring of ongoing quality assurance. This is an example of the NAL label for a device. This is a eye chart of the process in Chinese. We'll let you study that as, as you like. And for radio type approvals, there's a couple of different types of categories. There's something like wireless base station, and that's a subtotal of 10 types. So these are obviously industrial types of things that would be at a cell site, for example. Uh, microwave communication equipment, there's five types under there. And under category three for short range devices, subtotal of 12 types. And this would include things like Bluetooth, uh, Wi-Fi devices, low power devices, or we call the vernacular sh short range devices or SRDs. Now, when you have a, get a SRC approval, you can get the a radio import permit that you must apply with the customs. And that is the end of our discussion. Uh, thank you all for coming and uh, have a great rest of your day.